So our last speaker today is Duncan Baker-Brown. And I've worked with Duncan for years. He's a really good friend of Future Build and Eco Build, um, curating our waste zone over the years as well. Um, Duncan is an architect, an academic, an environmental act activist, and he's also of the Reuse Atlas, a designer's guide towards a circular economy, which was published by Re Reba. And sneak peek, get ready for version two coming out March next year. Um, He's practiced research and taught issues um, of sustainable development and closed loop systems for more than 25 years. So it's my absolute pleasure to have Duncan here today. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, brilliant to be here. Um, what brilliant speakers. I feel like just um, absorbing everything you've just said and thinking about it rather than speaking. But I have too many slides. Um, <laughs> So uh, I've got to get going, but you know we are here. Can we afford to save ourselves? Um, are we all climate emergency deniers? I think we are. OK, there's no vaccine, so why us? The construction sector consumes 50% of all raw materials mined and harvested every year. Oh, I'm going to have to stay here. OK. So 10 years ago, that was between 45 and 60 billion tonnes of stuff around the planet. It's now 100 billion tonnes of stuff. In the UK, we consume 600 million tonnes of products a year. We throw away 200 million tonnes of stuff. And 60% of that stuff is from the construction sector. That's 120 million tonnes of stuff a year we're throwing away. We're also, as a sector, pretty much responsible for 45% of carbon emissions, one way or another. We are in a hugely impactful sector. If you design a 10 metre by 10 metre concrete screed and you reduce the slab by 50 mil, you save more carbon than if you give up meat for a year. So in our business, we can do a lot of stuff and we can turn linear systems into circular ones. So some good news. Everybody's talking about the reduction in consumption of stuff. These guys won the biggest prize in architecture last year with the strap line never demolish, never replace. We've got campaigns to reduce VAT or make it equitable with new build on retrofit. And the campaign's got feet. Reuse is a big deal. People are sticking their hands to tarmac in the name of insulating our homes. It's yesterday's news, it's today's news, it's every day's news. Um, by the end of this year, a third of all households will be in fuel poverty. We're understanding about resources. This is uh, my almost namesake, Duncan Baker MP, who put forward a 10-minute bill to Parliament, which basically encouraged the understanding, and I think Gavin mentioned it, of embodied carbon, whole life carbon, as well as um, uh, operational carbon. In other words, building owners and developers will have to declare it. It's going to happen. 80% of today's built environment, of course, is with us, or will be with us in 2050, so that's the built environment that's got to meet net zero targets. So we've got to get our best in architects and designers and suppliers involved with retrofit. We have to stop using new resources whenever possible. That is a photo montage of the amount of copper you get out of a hole that big. We've also got to close conventional mines. Anyone in the audience a miner? No. Who wants to be a miner? No. So we've got to mine the Anthropocene. We've got to rework the human-made layer of stuff that's in our oceans, our atmosphere, landfill sites, our cities, the stuff that's already got a carbon footprint, and invest in the biotechnologies and the organic materials that will replace the stuff that has no end-of-life strategy at the moment. We actually know what to do. There are countless reports out there giving us whole-life carbon descent plans to buy into. Building regulations aren't quite there, but that's been well stated before today already. We've got circular economy route maps that are now imposed in London this year. Part of the London plan, we've got one in Brighton and Hove, where I'm from. We've got a good book as well that I wrote. <laughs> anyway, but that book was taking you on steps towards closed loop systems, with recycling being the most obvious, basic thing to do. And I'm just wanting to point out, because from the point of view of terminology, recycling is profoundly different to reuse. Recycling is where you crush, gr uh, shred, melt something, source material, and make it into something else. It has embodied carbon and waste uh, and problems associated with it. It's the first basic step. But if you can reuse something, that's hugely better. 
If you can reduce the amount of stuff you use when you go about your normal job, whether that's designing a pen, a car, or a city, that's a really big deal. And obviously, cradle to cradle, closed loop systems are the way to go. And cities are our hope, because cities are a material stores for the future, and most people live in cities now. And we've got to be looking at urban mining, reworking the stuff we've already got. And urban mining might look like that, adapting a Victorian building, so it's reduced its carbon footprint by 80%. I'm just looking at this. This is a couple of dull slides, but I, this is how interested our clients are. This is seven local authorities that have commissioned me to be in charge of a retrofit study looking at how to retrofit 45,000 social homes, how to do it with their maintenance budget. Where does their maintenance budget get them? They're mapping, we're, we're, sorry, we're mapping on eight different house types from bungalows to blocks of flats, material flows off the site, material flows onto site. What organic natural materials can we be specifying? These are the questions the clients are asking. Not me. We've done it before. This is from 2014. That's the Bryan Waste House. We constructed that with 360 students getting involved, builders, architects, designers. 90% of what you're looking at there is material other people threw away. We did it because at the time, for every five houses we were building, one house worth of waste went to landfill incineration. It's about every six and a half houses now. We then decided to make it this sort of vessel, because it's on campus at the University of Brighton, this sort of vessel containing products without an end-of-life strategy. So, 25,000 toothbrushes that were collected in only four days from Gatwick Airport, as off the planes as they landed. So this is, if you think about it, this is oil processed into plastic, processed into toothbrushes, put on an airliner to arrive in Gatwick to be incinerated by the end of the week. That's a, that's a dumb design idea. So we've looked at other projects, like turning oyster shells into stuff, like concrete tiles. The white ones are 100% oyster shells. This is a brick which is not fired. It's com hydraulically compacted. This is for the um, Design Museum in Ghent. It's made out of the earth on the site. The person that did the oyster shell tiles for us with the waste house is doing that in Ghent now. They're manufacturing 90,000 of these. So you can see the savings in, in uh, carbon there, and that's the building. Rota, deconstruct buildings other people would demolish. So you read these slides, top left to bottom right. Unpacking buildings, ugly buildings, big buildings, and redistributing that stuff into new building sites. They've got an online website. Other people are doing it. The Lendiger Group, or it's Lendiger Group from Denmark, cut up buildings <coughs> that would normally be smashed up and make new buildings out of them. This is reuse. And they've got a spin-off company, which, which is called again. And why I feature them and not Charlene's company is just because this is about a company born out of a need from the architects. The architects have not got the stuff they need yet. So we need companies like Charlene's. Because, again, is a company that finds waste and surplus material and then turns it into stuff that companies like Lendiger, who are a big com uh, architectural company, need. So these are waste resources turned into products. This is number one Triton Square, not far from here. That facade was 20 years old. That building is 20 years old. It still stands. It was going to be demolished. British land deconstructed, uh, well, it sanctioned the deconstruction, careful deconstruction of the curtain wall system. It was unpacked, put in a car park nearby cleaned up, upgraded, and put back up there. The only reason that could happen is because the supplies still existed. And that's sort of the good thing about the financial districts around the world, where the buildings get stripped out every five years and rebuilt every 20 years, is the supply chain still there. The suppliers can help us turn linear systems into circular ones, and we won't do it without suppliers. I'm going to, have I done my 10 minutes? Yeah, this is the last one. <laughs> This is a building that was built seven years ago. It was designed to be a material store. It was deconstructed this year. It is already reconstructed. And it looks like a normal building, because it is. So I'm going to end on that. We need, and we're getting, the digital and physical infrastructure to allow for a circular economy. London has a circular economy route map. And there are feasibilities all across London at the moment looking at 
things like remanufactories or circular economy construction hubs. These things, these facilitate, th these things that will facilitate deconstruction rather than demolition. Mm -hmm.